be read as follows. The People's Progressive Party wishes to alert the Guyanese people that apart from its consistent and persistent attacks on the Guyanese working people, the farming community, as well as the constant harassment and pressures being exerted on the business community, the party has taken note of a widespread view that the Granger administration is preparing the ground to perpetuate itself in office by fraudulent means, utilizing the coercive apparatus of the state to accomplish this nefarious objective. The party wishes to state that the basis for this widespread view, which has since transcended our national borders, is the growing recognition of the fact that responsibility for strategic decision-making in government has shifted from civilian political leadership to leadership by professional military officers. Our country is moving inexorably from a civilian to a military command-style administration permeating all levels of government. Our fledgling democracy is under threat, and Guyanese civil, political, and cultural rights are being undermined and trampled upon through the facade of social cohesion, a euphemism for the once despised Ministry of National Mobilization. In this situation, the PNC, which is the largest partner in the AP and APNU confabulation, will once again command the gun, and the gun will eventually command that party in respect of the direction the country will take and the nature of the democracy the people must endure and suffer. Cabinet, the National Security Committee, the Defense Board, decisions have already been transformed into operational plans characterized by a highly centralized command type structure of governance. The AFC, which has evolved into an appendage of the PNC as a result of their jaded and inexperienced ministers of government, will have no choice but to rely on the advice of the military command style Granger-led cabal, trained in the art of science, trained in the art and science of warfare and psychological operations in shaping and limiting the policy-making process, thus blurring any clear-cut line of civilian control and or influence in the administration of government business. It should not be seen as passing strange that the civilian-dominated AFC has already begun to encounter resistance, if not rejection, of its policy initiatives and manifesto inputs in light of the military's dislike for political directives from civilians. The rejection of the AFC's policy initiatives is manifested in its promise to increase the price of paddy to $9,000 per bag, to increase the salaries of ranks of the Guyana Defense Force, the Guyana Fire Service, and the Guyana Police Force to 25%, and to provide more jobs, plus its demand to chair cabinet sessions, all of which have been publicly rejected by the PNC-dominated APNU. And, as if to add insult to injury, because of the Granger Cabal's deep suspicion and discomfort in having security matters in the hands of civilians, the Granger-led APNU has sliced off a huge chunk from the former Ministry of Home Affairs responsibilities and embedded them 
at the Ministry of the Presidency, where the military dominates and is much more comfortable with, security, with the security portfolio under its wing. Guyanese would wish to learn of the degree of influence the AFC chicken hawks wield at meetings of the National Security Council and the Defense Board where the military is where the military influence is dominant. The People's Progressive Party has taken cognizance of the PNC's historical track record in respect of rigged elections and is of the view that the Guyanese people must be alerted to the possibility of that sordid track record being revisited once again with the PNC in power. The PPP will continue to be vigilant and at the same time to fight for free and fair elections the need for electoral reforms supervised by a revamped elections commission with a new chairman at its helm. Thank you. Question on the statement. I said at the last meeting we're coming forward with that. Sooner rather than later. Alan Harris. You know, this question of the military was asked of Mr. Green the last search when it published broadcast. Mm -hmm. And he said it was something he inherited from the previous administration. Now, if this was something that was there, why is it such a worry now? Well, you know, perception is the reality. Um, in the previous administration, you had a civilian president, a civilian prime minister, a civilian cabinet. So the administration and the whole system of governance was perceived as civilian. Today, you have an ex-soldier who is the president, an ex-soldier who is the right-hand man of the president, the Minister of State, Joe Harmon. You have a plethora, which he himself admitted, Granger, within the office of the president or the ministry of the presidency. And then we have a whole slew of persons being appointed, uh, minister, I mean, uh, soldiers either serving or ex in positions. So the perception in public, in the public, is that the military has taken on a major role in the administration of government business. Unlike under the previous administration, which was seen fundamentally as a civilian administration with a sprinkling of ex-soldiers in a few peripheral and not policy-making bodies. Now, take, for example, when they appoint soldiers to these commission of inquiry. The recommendation coming as a result of those inquiries are obviously coming from the ex-soldiers. So clearly these are recommendations that has a military orientation formulated by military people. And it is those recommendations that will influence the shaping of policy. That is the logical sequence of how things will go. And then the next thing you want to talk about is this is 
somewhere in many countries, military service is compulsory. For instance, the U.S., Great Britain, it's advisable that many people have military service. When most people end the service, and last week we said one's a soldier, all is a soldier, would we still see this thing in the same light? In those countries, I assume, I haven't read it, but you are claiming that it is so. I assume that you have read it. It is the law. It is the law. It is constitutional that such person must, after reaching the age of 18 or a specified age, must become a soldier or the Navy or the Air Force. In this country, that is not the case. We don't have those laws in our constitution. So why do we need to apply what is applicable in other countries under their constitution in our situation where it is not applicable? My friend, perception is important in any society. As they say, perception is reality. That's number one, and I'd like to emphasize that. We can't use that, uh, that view selectively. It is a general, universally accepted social and psychological phenomenon that perception is reality. No. Mr. Granger said that he is not going to discriminate against us. But is wanting to discriminate against individuals, but is not going to discriminate in favor of the individuals. So, in a sense, it is some form of affirmative action in favor of military rather than civilians. Now, who knows whether there's a civilian out there who is professionally trained and qualified versus a military officer who may not be. Why? Because soldiers are usually trained in military institutions. Civilians are trained in civilian type institutions. And that is the difference. A civilian is trained to treat with civilian matters. Soldiers are trained to treat with defense and security matters. So you have to be able to talk to a soldier especially the officer around to understand the type of training they have and what they end up to be as a professional soldier versus someone who may have passed through the public service, ended up as a permanent secretary, the highest level, and you will, fundament you will see the fundamental difference between the orientation of the two. These people, the latter, are trained basically to deal with civilian-oriented matters, how to deal with public servants, how to deal with applications for leave, how to deal with a whole set of different things. The soldier is trained differently. What, what, is try, what they're trying to sell us is that, look, there's no difference between these two. They're both human beings. Yes, of course they're both human beings. But which of the two are best suited to treat with public service civilian type matters. Soldiers are not trained that way. They are not. And in any event, military institutions are not democratic institutions. It's a command style institution where 
rules and laws and instructions are given, you have to command, you have to follow. In civilian and public service, it's more democratic. You have the right to strike, you have the right to protest, you have the right to speak out, you have the right to do many things. In a military organization, you are not entitled to do those things. If you go AWOL, you are to be arrested, charged, and put before a tribunal. This is not the case where a public service leaves the job. And the ratio, military it does not matter the ratio. The question is who controls the arms of the state, who has leverage in the arms and the, in the governance mechanism. Who are the influential factors? That is what matters. Well, you answered that question. All department executives are civilians. So um, the administration of the public service is in civilian hands. And you know, the, who is the, the public service comes under which ministry? The public servant. The public service? Uh. Um, we do not use the public service for that. No, 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 no. The minister of the presidency. But the so who is the head? The, the head would be the president on duty. If you say it's under the minister of the presidency, or Harmon, if you want both. to say that. Okay, both. But the prominent But it's the policy, my friend. It's the policy that we need to look at. Who articulates, who frames, who sets the policy? Where is that coming from? What's the genesis? Is it a civilian or is it someone who spent their entire life in a military organization? I have to emphasize this because it doesn't seem as though it is coming across. It doesn't seem as though it's coming across. And I think we need to do some more work in this area. So the problem is that these are civilians when all is said and done. The other thing that you talk about Militarization of the commissions of inquiry. Uh, in the past years, since the new administration came in, we had what? Three commissions. You had the Prison Riot Commission, was it three or four? I, don't know, I guess in all my memory, I think. Five? Ten. Yeah, ten commissions. Yeah. How many of these, except for the commission headed by Lovell and Bill Yasman, were headed? I don't think we could argue that way. I don't think we could argue that way in terms of numbers, whether of the 15, three were military, head by military men, mm -hmm. and um, 12 were non-military. I come back again to the perception and the reality. <laughs> the perception is that civilians had the commission. That's the reality then, according to you. So why would the fact that two soldiers are in commissions be of concern? Because there's a general perception <coughs> that the military is wielding a tremendous amount of influence on the apparatus of government. We measure the, oh, well, maybe you don't see it because you live in a different world. We don't live in the world of politics. We do. We live in the world of politics. We live it 24-7. So we see it. So our world is to be able to interpret politically what are these new social, economic, and other phenomena that is taking place in our country. That's why you have politicians. Well, put it this way, but in a democracy, the politicians are free to put out what their views are. Once they put out what their views are, then you are free. The media and other stakeholders are free to pronounce on those opinions.
my friend, it's not that that really matters, you know. It's the, the people who make the policy. Who are the people who sit down and make decision? How is the decision-making process influenced? For example, when the MPs go to Parliament, when AP and the FC MPs go to Parliament, you believe they sit there and make decisions? Why is it, for example, that Amna Ali and Nagamutu take certain positions in the National Assembly because they have been given directions by the cabinet where Harmon and Granger sits? And even before the cabinet, they would know what they are going to cabinet to say and position to take. So the big problem is Granger being a former soldier. The big problem is the perception that is growing and growing larger and larger that the military or that military influence is determining key policy issues in the country. Don't let us escape that factor. It's the policy issues that matter. Everyone is driven by policy. One man meat is another man's poison. What may be good for the USA and what may be constitutionally right and correct in the United States may not be. But co is, it on, is it not constitutionally correct here for them to do that? It's not in our constitution well, that you have to serve. When you finish, tell me. I don't want to engage in a polemic with you. When you finish your question, I will answer you. Tell me when you okay, finish. Mr. Are you finished? I am starting off from the premise that our Constitution does not stipulate that after a person serves, after a person reaches the age of 18 and above, they must join or serve in a branch of the discipline services. I'm starting off from that premise because this is where Mr. Adam Harris started off. That in other countries, they have that in their constitution. And the logical extension of that is once you have served in those organizations, they ought not to be a problem with you serving in government. In our country, there is no such provision in the constitution. Nor do we have in our constitution, like they have in the same United States that you're pointing to, the right to bear arms. We do not have those provisions here. So let us deal with these issues on the basis of our historical antecedents, customs, and practices. I am saying there's nothing precluding, right. there's nothing in the Constitution precluding the government from hiring a soldier. Right. But I have said, but you haven't heard me, I have said on balance, if there's a vacancy available, how do you decide whether the soldier is more qualified or a civilian is more qualified, especially in government, which is elected by the people for the people. Government is not a military institution. The military institution is part of the state. So if a, if a, a vacancy is opened up for something in government, who decides who is best qualified? A civilian who has the professional training and the qualifications academically or a soldier 
who pass through the GDF. When it comes to civilian matters in government, especially in line ministries or line responsibilities, it seems to us as civilians that the person best suited for that job is a civilian who has been academically trained and qualified for that post, as distinct from a soldier who came through the army ranks and who does not have the qualifications nor the training to fit that post. Back in a circle. No, sir. We are right. not coming back to a circle. President, uh, President Ramotar appointed this same oh government Lord. soldier to serve as the mission. My General. friend, I am talking about policy and decision-making process of governance. Why are you overlooking that? Joe Singh, Joe Singh yeah. was appointed under the PDPC. Right. But there was a civilian cabinet, a civilian, civilian president, right. a civilian, um, what you call it, uh, head of the presidential secretary, right. secretary for defense board. Right. Are you not seeing a difference now? Why is it but you're not I seeing a difference? I can't. You seem to be arguing. Anyway, comrade, listen, I'm not here for discussion no, no, with the media. No, I am not All getting right. into polemics with the media. Yeah. I've said what I want to say. Right. If you have a different opinion, say that in your media houses. So you're asking you say. a question, sir. I have answered it. No. Are you discriminating? I have I are you discriminating against the president because of his military background? I'm not personalizing anything here. I am talking about policy making decisions. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. Right. I am not personalizing anything here. That would be the least thing I would wish to do. I am dealing here with matters of policy. Any other issue? Yes. It's not for me to say that. It's not for me to say that. Why should I say that? That is a general perception out there. Well, the Kaicho News and the Stabuk News and now the Chronicle is helping to feed that perception, to reinforce the perception when we were in government, now that we're in the opposition. And the government is being driven by media houses to deal with this matter by setting up the SARA. So let's take it from there. Sir, you don't believe your, your, um, this perception was reality? Don't worry about what is my belief. <laughs> my belief is my belief. <laughs> Any other questions? You going back there again? No, but I'm asking if the PPP has general secretary, you can tell me. Is there a fear? Is there, there is a fear. Civilians will always be fearful of military men holding positions in office and executing policies driven by military doctrine. Well, that being the case then, sir, during the campaign leading up to May 2016, why wasn't being a military person brought to the fore to the members of the public to let people see that Guyana was being militarized. Who said we didn't do that? Are we being if you, well, the, the media didn't cover us. They and were John, very biased against us. And John Public didn't listen to you. 
That's not true. If John probably didn't listen to us, we wouldn't have gotten all those votes if we got rid of 4,000 stolen from us. 4,000 votes stolen from us? Yes. We've said that before. It's nothing new. This is something new. Yeah. Um, do you think they made a mistake? They will eventually decide because we know there's a lot of people complaining all over the country now that this change that they voted for is not the change that they're experiencing now. So time will tell. What are the two pieces? What is what? What are the two pieces? About what? About voting with the infrastructure. People have a right to vote for who they want to vote, but you know. Those who don't hear will feel that they're feeling the pressure right now. Everybody complain, and I don't know if y'all as journalists move around the country and don't hear. Y'all are Guyanese. You live in Guyana. You have friends. You have family. But if you want to report what your editor tells you to report, I can't help you. Well, you, know, anyway, you don't get that feeling in the community. Well, Chief, I can't help you with that. I can't help you with that. I hear it, and I know it every day. people <laughs> oh, she may be do something that I'm not usually good at doing and when you said um, I'm bringing this up but you think you can tell me when this race thing that you come by then can be made public or seems like it's just shown as comprehensive documentation into the last two or three that I turn in like I don't. I, 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 there's the certain. There's certain. Um, um, there's certain articles in the Titan that I don't read as a rule. Mm -hmm. In the recording. Don't say documentation. Some of the documentation that you asked about them and sent to this. No, I don't necessarily have to have a source. I don't want to be. Um, I don't want to associate these people with plagiarization or plagiarism. We need to do the hard research, painstaking research. Um, so the um, Sean Ferdinand putting things in the order that would be comprised on transportation. Do you have any comments on this? Yeah. Well, you know, as I said, I think at a press conference, who owns the dogs, call out the dogs. Did you say that? Yeah, you did. I did say that. It took him a long time before he said that, and maybe he was conscious of what was going to happen in Parliament. Well, let's wait and see what happens at the next sitting. Which is tomorrow. Yeah. But why you can't tell us? If it's on the other paper, and it's going to be discussed, surely you can tell us. Well, it's not being made public as yet. This is a fantastic element in military operations. So what is your reaction to the disclosures of somebody you had on your party to get to with Mr. Omar Shari? Interesting disclosures. Is there a reflection of what was No, man. Said? You can't talk in generality. Be specific. You know Omar Shari? No, he said somebody on some ticket. All right. What is the PPP's perception, reaction, once you like to the disclosures being made of a member of your elections, electoral slate in the run-up to the elections, Omar Shari, who was one of your candidates. Are these disclosures symptomatic of what was happening throughout the party? No. Why? I am not the only one. I don't know. Again, time will tell. You never investigated him? Me? Mm -hmm. I, was, I, I never wanted to be an investigator. It's not true. It's very true. Chief, you investigated the boss attack on some people who were going home from a campaign. I day. never investigated that, Mr. Harris. The police was asked to investigate that. And they made the findings known? Not to me. Mm -hmm. Not to me. Ms. Rory had a documentary. Mm -hmm. Um, 
not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. You mean whether he was a fundraiser? Personally? Yes. Whether he personally contributed? Yes. Not to my knowledge, no. no. Not to my knowledge either. He was not a member of our fundraising committee. Comet uh, Irfan was in charge of that. Plans are proceeding apace. Um, Mr. Zulfika, who is the chairman of the committee, has now um, set up the local Congress committee and they are working on the Escobar course to make sure that all the logistical and hospitality arrangements are in place to welcome and facilitate the good comfort of those who will be traveling from various parts of the country. And um, here in Georgetown, the Central Congress Committee is preparing uh, for the Congress as well. So all seems to be based on reports that we're receiving. Um, preparation seems to be proceeding of peace and in good order. And from the diaspora? What about the diaspora? Will the Congress Committee is yet to decide on inviting persons from the diaspora. Usually they, are, they do invite um, sympathizers and supporters of the party from the diaspora. Well, I would like to talk about something of the state then too, since you have exhausted your questions on of the statement issues. Uh, I read uh, in the weekend Stubble a feature article by Mr. Ramkaran in respect to the uh, expressing his views in respect to all party and claiming that Chedi Jagan must be turning in his grave as a result of statements which recently were made interpreting the PDP as a party pushing a racial agenda. And I keep trying to figure out who are these individuals and why are these particular individuals, what I would describe as the usual suspects that would be sniping at the People's Progressive Party from time to time on what I would describe as sexy and juicy issues to whet the appetite of persons who tend to, uh, you know, like to hear those things. First, it was Mr. Nagamoto as the head of Gina that raised this matter. And then Mr. Ramkaran. The two individuals, as you are aware, hopefully I think so, were all aspirants in the PDP to be presidential candidates of our party. Neither of the two of them succeeded in hoodwinking, mark my words, in hoodwinking the leadership of the PDP to support their reasons why they should be the presidential aspirants of the PPP. Having done away with the arguments and the rationale that was used by both individuals on different occasions, They both became sour pusses. Now you know when a person got a big ego and he doesn't get what he wants, if that ego is as big as Manhattan, it's a difficult thing to come to grips with because for some reason or the other, somebody was put in your head that why you the next president, why you the next man, and you the man to replace Chevy. And bills and bills and bills in you so you have people trying to you know stroke your ego and bolster whatever it is 
So Nagamoto ended up in the opposition as a member of the AFC. That's where he sought refuge. And that's where he got his consolation to get back, so to speak, at the PPP. And then he eventually ended up as the prime minister, even though he wanted to chair cabinet, but he didn't get through with that either. Yeah. Then Ralph Ramkaran, on the other hand, uh, sought his refuge in the media, but objectively on the side of the opposition. So one went to government, one went to the media. But the genesis was common, that they did not get, they did not hoodwink, manage to hoodwink the PPP to become the presidential candidates of the party at two distinct periods. The bottom line, therefore, for all these statements analysis that is being made is self-interest. On both sides of the divide, it is self-interest. And projecting themselves as keepers of Chedi Jagan's legacy. In other words, the 35 members of the current Central Committee and the 18 members of the current Executive Committee are not the keepers of Chedi Jagan's legacy, nor are they the custodians of all that he stood for. Out of the recent announced census of Guyana, there are two lily white individuals who are the custodians of Chedi Jagan's policies and programs and of his legacy. And we know who these two individuals are. Now, the other point I'd like to make is the question of credibility. You see, when people make statements and try to influence the public, credibility is important. Now, Nagamoto may be the prime minister of the country, and through conventional eyes, he may have credibility by virtue of his government position. What is different is something different to have credibility as someone in government and of thy own self. So credibility is not something that one is bestowed as a result of government and state positions. It is something that is earned. And we all know that. So both Mr. Nakamoto and Mr. Ramkaran, two peas in the same pod, do not have credibility when it comes to making the type of analysis they make and seeking to influence John public, John or Jane public, on matters of the type in which they have recently pronounced. One may very well hazard a guess that in the case of Mr. Ramkaran, he may very well be taking those positions which are objectively supportive of the government, objectively supportive of the government, because it can't be seen as supportive of the PPP. If one is to take a collection of his articles that have been written over a number of years, he would see that on balance, they are objectively supportive of the government. Now, he may very well be taking those positions, and this is not a question of being of using ad hominem arguments. But they may very well be more in the mortar than in the pestle. They may very well be more in the mortar than in the pestle. 
avoiding, for example, of a major um, of a scandal of monumental proportions, or personal family diplomatic interest. Vengeance politics will get neither of them anywhere because this is precisely what they are both practicing. Vengeance politics in an attempt to get back at the PPP for them not getting their way, which was to be the presidential candidates of the PPP. In this particular case of the recent article in the Starbucks News, to which the Kaichin News and the Starbucks News have la and the Chronicle have latched onto, of course, for their own political objectives. My own view, because I think you all like to hear the GS's view. My own view is that in the case of Mr. Ramkaran, he's either living in a bubble, a cocoon, or a fool's paradise. You choose which one. But in either of the three, it's the same. Now, Mr. Ramkaran has lived and worked in the PDP for over 40 years. And what he's saying, I don't think, is music to the ears of anyone in Guyana. What is he telling the PVP supporters? Is he telling the PP is he talking to the PVP supporters? Is he talking to the supporters on the AP and the AFC? Who is he talking to? Or is he talking to himself? Because I think usually when when someone sits down, you journalists know this quite well. When you decide to put pen and paper, you obviously try to influence to the medium through which you communicate with people a message. So what is the message that he's conveying and to whom? It can't be to the PVP supporters, because they know what they're going through, either at a personal or professional or business level. They know what they're going through. So is he speaking to the converted? Is he speaking to the other side, meaning the AP and the AFC supporters? And would that mean anything to them? Because I think I saw a caricature in today's Starbucks News or some day ago, some time ago, and a, 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 a cartoon. No, I think it was two. And you know, I always remember the famous, as you would recall, these journalists are pretty young. I'm not so sure whether they would know this. The famous Travelodge speech. You know, Travelodge Hotel in Canada, in Toronto, that Dr. Jagan gave just before he passed away and how that was milked. So, people like Mr. Ramkaran, like I said, um, I don't think we need to take those views seriously. This country has a political and social reality. Every commentator who has written, academic or otherwise, or independent journalists who have written on Guyana have always made the point about the ethnic cleavages in our country, which we inherited from the British, and which the British fostered in this country like they did in so many parts of the world. It wasn't ethnic, it was religious. If it wasn't religious, it was something else. It was tribal. So we have certain realities in this country. And if one tries to stoke that reality in a manner that 
reflects the reality. Well, I don't know how history will judge that. But that is all I wish to say at this point in time on that matter. Sure. 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 It is a f if, if, if it is a fact that what? Secrets? Well, you know, uh, when Mr. Nagamoto uh, became, I think, the associated in a high profile way with the AFC, I think I said it in this very room about skeletons in his cobbles. And some members of the media, I don't see them here right now, because you know the media is constantly you know, changing. Media representatives, they're here, today they're gone, tomorrow we're always here. You know, um, they go after different things. Am I correct? No, so you're saying that you got secrets for them? No, I was just saying that media representatives no. change. Well, we got but we are constant. Yeah, I know. We got no, I wanted to stick to that one. Yeah, I want to and to say it. that some of them may not remember what I said about Mr. Nagamutu. And that is because the media is constantly, you know, like amoeba. Yeah. Um, are you saying that Mr. Ramkaran's analysis was flawed? That he had no right to chide former President Dan Hills for the comments he made? I would be the last to chide anybody for saying what they have to say. Because I also believe in my right to say what I have to say in this country. I have the right to say what I want to say in the PVP as well. But when the PVP makes a decision and I'm in a minority, I go with the majority. But when it comes to Guyana, my country, my country, which I've lived for over 66 years, I have a right to say what I want to say in this country. If I go to another country, it's a different matter. But this country, and I put a lot into this country, right? I have a right to say what I want to say. So I will be the last to tell a man or a woman, you don't have a right to say that. I may not agree with you, but then you still have your right to say what you want to say, but then, you know, those rights, all rights are constrained by certain constitutional provisions. Like they say, you can't run in a cinema and shout fire, fire. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.